welcome to Journalism History, a podcast that rips out the pages of your history books to re-examine the stories you thought you knew and the ones you were never told. I'm your host, Terry Finneman, guiding you through our own drafts of history. This episode is sponsored by the Communication Department at William Patterson University in Wayne, New Jersey, offering award-winning programs in journalism, broadcasting, and other areas The department is committed to preparing its students for life in the professional world after graduation. Our greatest strength is helping you find yours. More information is at wpunj.edu. As the Great Depression gripped the United States in the early 1930s, the Hoover administration sought to preserve jobs for Anglo-Americans by targeting Mexicans, including longtime residents and even U.S. citizens for deportation. Mexicans comprised more than 46% of all people deported between 1930 and 1939, despite being only 1% of the U.S. population. In all, about half a million people of Mexican descent were deported to Mexico, a quote-unquote homeland many of them had never seen, or returned voluntarily in fear of deportation. They Came to Toil is a book that investigates how the news reporting of this episode in immigration history created frames for representing Mexicans and immigrants that persist to the present. Melita Garza of Texas Christian University is our guest today and sets the story as it takes place in San Antonio, Texas. Melita, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. You open your book with some personal stories about your grandfather teaching Spanish to his children, who were banned from speaking anything but English in San Antonio public schools. And you discuss your mother, who had to sit in the back of her classroom with other Mexican-American students. Tell us about your other inspirations for writing this book and why you wanted to focus on the Great Depression years in particular. Well, ever since I was born on Air Force Base in Madrid, Spain, I have grown up with this bilingual, dual English language, Spanish language culture. Um, And also it required me not only to navigate, once we got back to the United States, my father was a military officer. um, And once we got back to the United States to navigate between a primarily English speaking world outside my house and my bilingual world inside my house. So growing up mainly in the Washington, D.C. area, but living in a a few other cities that were not big uh, Spanish language cities um, required me to to really have this dual identity. Um, So I also had to pivot between the Spanish language world of my grandparents when we would visit them in San Antonio, Texas, and and the uh, the rest of my identity as an English language speaker in primarily English language schools. So from very early on, I understood the significance of media representation, even if I didn't have a clue about that concept as a child. But um, it was one manifestation of that with every city that we lived in the United States, my parents, whose first language was, was Spanish, even though they were born in the United States, um, would be to look for the local Spanish language movie theater and to try to find, of course, movies um, that depicted different facets of Spanish language culture. And this is pre-Netflix, pre-cable. So there weren't a lot of options and availability for this kind of um, international and ethnic programming, except to go to the Spanish language movie theater. So, um, and then of course, my my father, and my mother would typically be reading books simultaneously in both English and Spanish. So this was just to me a very kind of normal state of affairs. And so when I got to to journalism, to study journalism after a 20 year career of practicing journalism and, and was sitting in a class called American Journalism History, I began to realize that what was being defined as American Journalism History didn't have uh, what I knew to be the components of true American journalism, which was representation of Spanish language media, at least not to the degree that I knew it was important. So those were some of the primary reasons. And then, of course, the, the stories that I learned growing up about my 
my parents as depression age children. Um, of course, the Great Depression was a time of great hardship for, for everyone, no matter what their background. But it was particularly difficult if you were considered to be un-American and, and granted realizing that these people that I'm talking about, my parents were Americans. They were born in the United States. And ironically, they were born in the city of Spanish speaking. It was founded by Spanish speaking immigrants, San Antonio, Texas. So I understood from very early on that there was this concept of being a second class citizen, simply on the basis of perhaps having a vowel in your last name, speaking a language in addition to English, understanding a culture that was um, equally rich, but different from what has been defined as mainstream English language culture, and by extension, media, which is a prime component of culture. So those were some of the key ideas that I that were in the back of my mind as I was sitting in this journalism history course as a PhD student, and I began to think about what could I do that would really make a difference that would be difficult for somebody else to do. Um, where I could make my mark, which is, of course, what every journalist and presumably every journalism historian wants to do. And I had originally entered with the idea of doing something from my business journalism background, perhaps off the Great Recession, and then then really pivoted into this other idea of the Great Depression and the implications for um, for media and for the idea of immigrants in particular. In your book, you studied English and Spanish language San Antonio newspapers between 1929 and 1934. Tell us about what you were looking for specifically. Well, specifically, again, I was looking for that reality that I didn't re see reflected in our understanding of American journalism. And I was looking for ways in which this idea of the consciousness of the past was reflected differently or perhaps similarly in different publications existing in the same time and space and the same point in history, but constructed by people with different backgrounds and different stories. So I wanted to see how they handled this explosive issue of immigration, which was a huge issue then as it was at the time I was writing the, my dissertation, which has continued to be now that it's evolved into my book. You did end up finding out that these newspapers made different news judgments about Mexicans, Mexican-Americans, and immigrants in San Antonio and the nation. You note that the forced and voluntary removal of hundreds of thousands of people of Mexican descent, many of them U.S. citizens from all corners of the country during the Depression years, did not receive the same amount of attention depending on the paper. Talk more about what you found. Right. So, so in, in communication studies, we have this concept of symbolic annihilation, right? This idea that uh, that a, a, a people or um, a group of people can be uh, stigmatized, trivialized, uh, demonized, um, as well as simply omitted from the media frame. So what I was looking for was how well was this incredible story of people being forced to leave, in many cases, the only land they had ever known, right? And uh, how is that massive diaspora, how is that massive movement of humanity covered or not covered, depending on the political positioning of the newspaper? So what I found, in fact, was something quite different. Uh, we talk a lot about mainstream news or legacy news as though it was just, it's just one thing or was just one thing. And in fact, what I found, I think most startling was that the two legacy newspapers or mainstream newspapers that were working in San Antonio at the time, publishing in San Antonio at the time, actually had very, very different conceptions of reality. So looking back and reading those news pages, we find a different consciousness of the past. And one paper, of course, the Hearst own chain operated newspaper uh, through its editorial page, had quite an alarmist, jingoist uh, view of immigrants. And the other paper, the San Antonio Express, which is now evolved into the San Antonio Express News, was a paper that reflected the, it, the business interests, the ranching, farming, and railroad interests that had been in Texas for a long time and that had long developed ties with Mexico, 
And so it was very close to uh, and understood the relationship between Texas and Mexico. So, so that was one thing. And I, that was perhaps the most surprising thing. I wasn't necessarily surprised to find out that La Prensa, which was founded in 1913 by an immigrant from Mexico who fled the Mexican Revolution, that that newspaper was uh, more humanistic and more detailed about its coverage. So, um, so that in itself was not surprising, but I think the degree to which the Mexican immigrant newspaper, which again, as I said, was founded by a, a person from Mexico, Ignacio Rosano, was, was really trying to, in some ways, develop this transnational understanding between Mexicans from Mexico and Mexicans living in the United States, many of whom were Mexican Americans, American citizens. And this is maybe not so obvious to um, to, to non-Mexican Americans, but the idea that, that someone has left their country in Mexico and has now gone over to the other side can be seen by some people in Mexico as a kind of a, a sellout. Um, so, so on the other hand, though, what I saw was that the paper was trying to establish this idea that Mexican people, wherever they lived, whatever nation they found themselves in, were actually tied together. And of course, reflecting the idea that the land in which all of this was taking place was once Mexico. Discuss the significance of this in the context of civil rights and American history. So one of the, one of the points I make in my book is the idea that uh, the understanding of civil rights that we typically have, that being constrained by geography, the South by a specific time period, roughly Brown versus Board of Education to say uh, the uh, the Voting Rights Act. Uh, so uh, the, this, this idea of civil rights as being particular to a time, a geography, and a people, that that uh, negates the, the broader understanding of this quest for personal freedom that exists in the United States and frankly, everywhere in the world. So, uh, so what I have used as an underlying premise of, the, of my work is this concept of not just the long civil rights movement, which would extend the timeline, uh, but also the wide civil rights movement, which includes other groups, including issues of civil rights related to gender, uh, race, uh, ethnicity, class, geography, and generation. So the significance of the civil rights history is that so much of what has been uh, left out of civil rights history results from this paradigm, uh, part, partially constrained by the black white race binary, partly, partially constrained by, by other ideas about what constitutes civil rights. So by leaving out these stories, we leave out a part of history. By leaving out a part of history, we leave out a part of our present understanding, or perhaps to paraphrase John Bodner, right? We, we uh, are missing those ingredients, those historical ingredients that help people make sense of not only their past and their present, but also their future. So uh, that is one of the issues with this study is that there was so much that is left out of the news. Uh, and it's hard to imagine recalling that Texas, Texas is important because Texas in this story of mass migration during the Great Depression, Texas was the single most important state where, where the deportations and repatriations were most extensive, where trainloads, literally trainloads of thousands of people and caravans of cars. Now, caravan is a word that I found um, in the in the news. Uh, it's been picked up recently and used in other ways. But um, so uh, people walking, people taking boats from New York and Boston and Alaska, and and uh, all some some people were even flying back to Mexico or to Mexico. So so this is not something that you could easily ignore. If you lived in Texas, and particularly if you lived in San Antonio, which 
was a, a city, of course, as we know, founded by Spanish speaking immigrants in which at this point in history, the celebration of the Spanish founders and their culture and their buildings, which are now um, considered some of the most important uh, historical buildings in the world, the, the Franciscan missions, were being celebrated and restored. And while all of this cultural renaissance was being reconstructed by the white Anglo population predominantly, at the same time, the inheritors of that culture, the descendants of the people who built and founded that city, literally built and founded that city, were being expelled. And how could that not be covered in a mainstream news organization, especially when it, it was so contrary to the, if you, must be uh, utilitarian about it, so so diametrically in opposition to any basic economic foundation that the state of Texas was founded on. I mean, we have heard the same stories today about fruit rotting in the fields and not finding people to do work, uh, particularly today in the construction industry. Well, um, at a time when people were out of work, there was still a need for people to work. So this was this was a problem, and it was also fueled by a lot of bigotry and um, anti uh, anti brown person sentiment. Speaking more broadly to start, what are issues that remain today in how the press covers immigrants and immigration? Well, I think one of the big, one of the big problems with with covering immigration today is that many of the consumers of the news don't have a clear understanding of the history of this country, do not understand the primary foundational role of the Spanish speaking immigrant in developing this, this country and indeed what is you know, a, a large part of the United States today. So I think having a clearer knowledge of history would certainly help and that, that is a continuing theme. Another continuing theme of course is simply the, the otherism, um, the idea of marge of, of, people that look differently, that have a different language and culture, um, are ostracizing the, these people. Um, so lack of understanding of culture, lack of understanding of history, uh, xenophobia, so this an great antipathy to foreigners. And of course, the irony here is that these people were not foreigners, are not foreigners, but have long been part of this land. So those are continuing themes. And I, I think that Part of the problem with all generations of journalists, of course, is that we are all products of our day, right? We are all products of our education and our upbringing and of the social mores and codes that we bring to the table. So, so we have to evaluate the omissions, not excuse, but evaluate, understand the omissions of the news makers of the past, and I mean those the creators of the news, that um, they were in some ways constrained by their own formation, by their own role. How have you felt about press coverage of President Trump declaring a national emergency at the border and the related stories about immigration? Well, much of what we hear today from Trump and from other politicians who espouse similar uh, views is simply, quite simply, resonant with the past. Um, the language, the dehumanization, the the parallels between people, the immigrants and animals, referring to them as vermin, um, talking about expelling them, talking to them about as aliens, talking about them as criminals. All of these things are found in the pages of these newspapers in San Antonio, which were at the heart reflected the the differences of the debate of the time. And the debate of that time, many of the ideas that that were heard at the debate of that time are, are recycled into the debate of today. Uh, one of the big themes in the Hearst Press and the Hearst editorials in particular was this idea that we should follow the, the route of Canada. We should select only the best because that's what Canada does. So over and over again, we, we have heard President Trump also refer to the Canadian model of only the fittest, only the best um, kind of idea. So really to understand the, the, the tropes and the concepts that are being 
discuss today, it's essential to understand the tropes and the concepts of the past because this is where they began to bear fruit. This is where they began to be disseminated widely through, uh, particularly through chain-operated newspapers. And I might add through, and, uh, and on the other side, through La Prensa, which was the most uh, circulated Spanish language newspaper of its day, circulated in almost every state in the nation and of course in Mexico. So I think understanding that ideas were widely disseminated, even though they were localized and started in a San Antonio press, it's really important uh, to, to understand the way that San Antonio f news fueled some of these ideas. What differences are there in how Texas media are covering immigration right now versus national media? Well, I think that it depends on the news outlet. I think uh, we have uh, the San Antonio Express, uh, the Express News, the Dallas Morning News. Um, these these papers are very close to uh, where all of these issues are happening and have a different understanding. Um, much as as the the press of the past did. When in fact, one of the points that the Express made when they were talking about the policies of, of restriction, restricting Mexican immigration during the 30s, when they were speaking out against that through their uh, the bully pulpit of their editorial page, they said, you guys in Washington don't really understand this part of the country. You're over there in Washington making up things and you have no idea what's really, the, what's really at, at issue here. And I think that that is actually something that can persist today. So we have a lot of very talented journalists um, from you know, thinking just off the top of my head from, uh, from the Dallas Morning News, Diane Solis and Alfredo Corchado, among others, um, who have um, uh, really been at the forefront of telling this story and who have a deep understanding of the role of Mexico in our national economy, our state economy, as well as the cultural influences and are close to the ground. Um, so I think you will find a much richer understanding of, of news coming from Texas on this issue. At the same time, I really feel our national publications have evolved considerably there's some great reporting coming out of um, the Los Angeles Times and, of course, the New York Times and some some great freelance work as well. The Texas Tribune has done a great job as well. So I think um, it's a little bit different newscape today, um, but uh, I think nothing beats living and being at the scene for understanding it. The book shines a light on the critical role that the ethnic press provides in helping give a voice to the voiceless. As a journalism professor, how do you advise your reporting students to do this? Well, I think it's very important for any journalist, whether they're in mainstream or, or legacy media or or in a um, ethnic press, to read to read widely and to be aware of what the other media are also producing. So, so from the start, if you're in a mainstream press. Uh, you should be reading the, the other newspapers. I recall as a journalist at the, at the Chicago Tribune on the city desk, we'd every day get the, the Chicago Defender. So how many people actually picked up the Defender and read it? I think very few. Um, so I think that, that we need to do, to do more of that. And, and so, so that's for starters. I think, um, what you're really getting at is the question of perhaps cultural competency as it's sometimes framed. But I, I'm going to push back on this idea and say it's really not an issue of cultural competency. It's an issue of journalistic competency because our goal as journalists is to get the truth. And the truth has become a very amorphous sort of term in some respects. But when I say get the truth, I mean get, gain a complete grasp and understanding of the story to the best of your ability. And you simply cannot do that if you are unable to communicate with the people that you should be reporting on. So I urge my students to learn as many languages as possible, uh, for starters. I also urge my students to, uh, to really know and understand the concept of fault lines. Fault lines is another under, underlying premise of my book. 
It's how I extend the idea of the long and wide civil rights movement. So I extend th this idea by adding Rob, uh, Robert C. Maynard's ideas uh, about, as I mentioned earlier, generation, geography, race, class, and gender, and put those into a toolbox that says, do you understand your own uh, fault lines? But, the way in which you, where you came from, where you were raised, might affect the way you see the world. So, uh, so that that's one. And then, of course, understanding that they might have to cross fault lines of generation. They might have to have a different, uh, be able to make a leap when they're interviewing somebody who is 91 and they are 21. How are they going to do that? Uh, so, I think not making assumptions, moving aside these ideas that they might have about who these people are, whoever those people might be, and and trying to get to the truth of the story. So so it's a difficult position because, as I mentioned earlier, we're all products of our time and our culture. Before we leave, I wanted to discuss the opening quote you have in your book. It says, much of the content of the press is intended solely for its own day. Yet just because it is the day's report of itself, it is the permanent record of that day to all other days. This was a comment made in the 1947 Commission on Freedom of the Press report. Talk about why you think that quote is so important. So again, it goes to this idea of the press being in some ways an official record, a, a repository of the quote unquote truth. Um, and so I think Another way to think about it is, as as the commission said in 1947, that the press is seen as the, quote, swift self-expression of each moment in history, right? So so news in whatever time is, is a cultural product, again, reflecting these sensibilities, mores, codas, social structures, and most importantly, the inequalities of the people of the day. So I think understanding that record and what's missing from that record and what's in that record and how that record might compare to other records is critically important. So um, that's one thing. Um, I think also talking about that record in terms of what's missing and the omissions, which I touched on briefly before, I, I think it's important to note or to at least ask ourselves, how much do we recognize that journalism history in many ways is white people's history. And I say that in the sense that for so many years, people of color and, and, and women to some degree were excluded from the news, right? So we're excluded from being practitioners of the news. And so when we go back and we look at the people who created news, we tend to focus on specific uh, you know, the Pulitzers, the Hearsts, et cetera, um, which is kind of the easy way of looking at history. And I think we have to dig deeper. And, and people are doing that. People have written recently, many historians have, and, and in the not so recent past, they've written some great histories about pioneering women journalists and pioneering African-American journalists. I, I just feel there's a lot more stories out there that we, have, uh, we haven't gotten to that cross the fault lines. Um, and I think it's also important to note that to think about to what extent the practitioners back in the day when minorities were barred from working in the news, to what extent were the other news gatherers complicit in this discrimination? I mean, they were a product of their time and their mores, but were they on some level aware that they were part of a privileged class who was deciding for the public what was important, who was worth noting, what stories were worth noting, what Exodus of thousands of people should be ignored or should be brought to to the public's attention. I think I think we need to look a little bit at that, not not to judge the people of the past from our understanding of today, but to try to understand how the people of the past were a part in practice. When I say the people, the journalists of the past were really a part in a practice of this, even though they may not have been decision makers in the rules that barred women and minorities and others from having jobs interpreting our reality. So that's really what we're talking about is to what extent can we as historians help 
uncover the reality of the past, understanding what was in the news and what wasn't in the news. So to kind of tie everything all together, our final question of the show is always, why does journalism history matter? Well, I think to answer that question, um, I would like to to um, paraphrase some of the ideas of a one of the greatest poets in our, in our country, a New Mexican writer, Savin Ulivari. And uh, he talked about history and he talked about time as being a continuum. And he said it, it flows like a river flows and that we have tended to chop up into past, present, and future. And then when we chop up into past, present, and future, um, he, he has argued that we let the past drop out of the flow. And this is really a critical problem because if the past is out of sight and we know the future is not here yet, then we are just living in the present moment. And so if we live only in the present moment with no knowledge of the past and no certainty about the future, although we can speculate, um, he, calls, he calls this as living in a condition of historical amnesia, of living in a condition of cultural amnesia. So I think as journalists, I mean, obviously as a consuming public of the news, we need to understand these issues. But I think it's really critical for our students. And one of the things that disturbs me is the extent, greatly is the extent to which uh, many, uh, or I, I should say at least several prominent journalism programs have chosen to ad- omit journalism history as something that is perceived to be irrelevant from any kind of skill that a working journalist might possibly need. And I think this is a tremendous disservice. It's a tremendous disservice because if you don't know where you came from, how do you know where you are or where you are going? And I think if you also, as a working journalist, if you have any concern or care for doing a job that crosses the fault lines, which is essential if you want to achieve that paramount goal of journalism, which is to be complete and accurate as possible, how can we do that if we continue to exclude our understanding of other, of people who are different from us? So I, I, that's really tying everything together. But you asked me to do that. So um, those are my thoughts on why we need journalism history. Okay, well, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for tuning in. And additional thanks to our sponsor, the Communication Department at William Patterson University. And to Taylor and Francis, the publisher of our academic journal, Journalism History. Until next time, I'm your host, Terry Finneman, signing off with the words of Edward R. Murrow. Good night and good luck.